Hey, my name is Zach Breckenridge. Thank you for being on my channel. I want to take this opportunity to share with you my testimony from alcoholic to apostle. I grew up in church, in and out of church, I should say, for most of my early life, more in than out, though I remember a particularly long period of time in which we were out of church. It was actually at eight years old, my father's cousin passed away, and I begged my parents to return to church at that point. It was after facing death for the first time as a child that I began to fill this void in my life. And that summer, at the age of eight, I shared that with my parents. I remember my second grade teacher actually telling my mom that year that there was something special and unique about me, that I, I always wrote about God in and on my assignments, and that he had a great plan for my life. You know, Proverbs 26, 6 says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Even though we were out of church for a long time, what church I had had already taken root. So my family returns back to our family church, the church that my grandparents attended. And I remember telling my mother and my father that I had this void in my life. And I knew that I needed God. And my dad called the preacher and they said that I'd get baptized on Sunday. And it Now, it must have been a Monday or a Tuesday. I don't really recall, but I do remember begging for them to do it at the Wednesday evening service because if something happened to me, I didn't want to miss God. Sunday morning came and the preacher said, I'm going to ask you three questions. You'll say yes to all three of them and we'll baptize you. See, I was raised Church of Christ. So at eight years old, I was baptized. And I remember the, the elderly church ladies coming up and saying, that was the best decision of my life, right? And I remember even at eight years old thinking, this cannot be it. It still felt incomplete. Like this wasn't that big of a deal, See, I went into the baptism on that day, a dry center, and I came up a wet one. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't have a relationship with him. But for 13 years, I lived a good, legalistic, Christian childhood. I was a straight-A student. I was respectful. I was always concerned about doing what was right. I valued education and intellect. I was well-organized, planned, goal-oriented, self-driven, and highly competitive. If you were to write a book about a perfect child and a perfect childhood, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I could have been an example in those days, but perfect children can still go to hell. Just shortly after being baptized, my, my parents left that church and they relocated to another church of Christ on the other side of town. And when I asked my dad why, why we left, he responded that the church had removed all of their leadership team from making decisions, even though the Bible instructs them otherwise. They, they did it all because they didn't like one of the leaders and what he said. So at eight years old, I had my first exposure to church politics as well as church government. So middle school went on, junior high, and then high school. All went according to the normal Southern Bible Belt childhood story, just like you'd want a good Christian child to perform. I was so studious that the optometrist actually said when I was in sixth grade that the only reason I developed a need for glasses or contact lenses was because I spent so much time reading books that I trained, taught my eyes, my body, that they didn't need to develop long-range sight. So life was pretty good. I actually got a full-paid scholarship to Arkansas State because of academics is where I attended for my undergraduate degree. But after my first semester of college, a life-changing and altering event occurred. My parents got a divorce. They got divorced because of my father's unfaithfulness. And I was just finishing up at that time a philosophy class, and it was already shaking the little faith that I had. And there I was at 19 years old, and the world I grew up in was shattered. The very man who taught me about the book and was my model for it abandoned it. And just a couple months later, he attempted suicide. At that point in my life, I was a full-time college student responsible for running my father's, at the time, over multi-million dollar plus business, which paid for all of his assets as well as all of my mother's due to the alimony that was already set up. So that was the point that I began to drink myself to sleep every night. I was able to perform. I was a high-functioning alcoholic, but in order to 
relax my mind and my body enough to go to sleep, I drink myself to sleep every night. Being part Scottish and Irish, vodka's in the bloodline, so, or it was. See, my dad was a closet alcoholic, too. I got tired of that after some time, and I tried once again to do it in my own strength, to build on my own nature the perfect American dream. Perfect, and it was well-supported and directed career path of choice with the number one Fortune 100 company that was began in my home state. And I had the relationships to back that and to get me to the top of that company very quickly. Just a few more years into college, though, my plans, they all changed again. Once more, it wasn't by my own decisions, but the decisions of others that were in my life. And this time, it was just before my 21st birthday. On my 21st birthday, I went out with my friends, with my dad and his friends, and we drank. This time, the bottle didn't fill me. I was still empty. The day after my 21st birthday, I went with my mother to her new Baptist church that she was now attending, and the preacher shared about seminary and his time at seminary, and I thought, that's for me. Something resonated. Something in my spirit rose up, and the Sunday school teacher shared on testimonies in that every salvation is a radical testimony, and just because you don't have this big, large sin exchange in your life doesn't make it not radical, and and while that made sense, I had the thought... That's what I'm missing. I actually can have one of those radical testimonies. I just need to give my life to Jesus. So the day after my 21st birthday, I did exactly that. I gave my life to Jesus, and I began a real relationship with him. But at this point in my life, I'm in a Southern Baptist church. I'm still a long ways from where I am at this point in my journey today. See, after realizing that those baptism waters didn't save me, I actually was re-baptized a few months later. I was first baptized into a baptism of repentance from dead works, but for me, I wasn't saved in that moment. So for 13 years, if I would have died, I would have spent the remainder of eternity in hell. And this time, I got the relationship part right, though. But they still had some old covenant ways in them, like John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. I hadn't heard of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I was more than hungry for the Word of God. I had been starved of it. I began sharing with everyone I could, everyone that was in that church, all my friends that were outside of that church. I was reading the Bible with such a new perspective, with such new sight. And and I went to these early morning Bible studies. I began to start early morning Bible studies for people my own age. And nine months into my salvation, I went on my first missions trip to the nation of Nicaragua. And the first morning that we were there... I led one man to Christ as I preached, and I shared from my testimony. And he was the only man who gave his life to Jesus that day on our trip. And God totally wrecked me. See, I had already asked before and been turned down by church leadership, but in that nation, on the last day of our mission trip, I surrendered my life to the call of ministry that was on it. Ironically, all those years later, my second grade teacher was on that trip too. Isn't that interesting? And then I began the fight for my faith that was fixed by God. The fight between the way of the Pharisees and the way of Jesus Christ himself. Being taught by one mentor about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and laying hands on the sick myself and watching them recover by the morning hour. And being instructed at the same time by my religious institution that those ways were dead. and They had the PowerPoint presentation to prove it. I even had a copy on my laptop. Less than a year and a half later at this point, after my conversion, I went to seminary, a Southern Baptist seminary, which ordered me to not pray in tongues. See, I received before this the gift of tongues while I was in the nation of Nicaragua again on another trip during a 30-day time of consecration before the Lord, before I entered into seminary. There was a man there at at one of the evening crusades, and he was wheelchair-bound, and he would beat his tambourine, and he would yell, and he, he was doing everything that he could to distract, to detract from the name of Jesus. Every time the evangelist would speak about Jesus and mention the name of Jesus, he would do something so that the crowds couldn't hear the name of Jesus. So a fellow intern and a translator myself, we went up to confront him, and as we did this, he literally began manifesting a demon and praying in demonic tongues standing right in front of me. 
our translator was shocked and she didn't know what to say or what to do. And I responded, I do. And I hit my knees and knowing that the word of God says that the spirit gives us words when we know not what to pray. There I was on my knees. I received the gift of praying in tongues, praying in the spirit, the gift of tongues. And my first tongue was for spiritual warfare. But then I went into seminary where I learned that that was not necessary for today. However, the most important lesson that I ever learned in seminary was this. Preach what is in the Bible. Don't add anything to it and don't take anything away. And I thought, well, Jesus never taught in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, so I just won't address that. I won't talk about that in my ministry either. Until I had married my wife and we were sitting in Seattle helping to plant the second church that I helped plant. And I came across a passage where Jesus did speak about this to his disciples and about the coming of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he, he used those exact words. A year into seminary, see, I had heard about the lostness of the Northwest and that if every church were filled seven times on a weekend, only 40% could even get into a building. So I relocated to Seattle and a month later, Natalie and I got married. At the time of relocating and us getting married, I was a Southern Baptist missionary. I was paid, and I was a part of the North American Mission Board. And our sending church, the one whose payroll I would have guessed technically been on, was a small, was from a small little town back in Arkansas near where I was raised. It's the town of Jonesboro. It's actually the town that I minister in to this day. But... Now that I had seen that Jesus had taught on the Holy Spirit, I began reading my Bible with fresh eyes again. And I saw in the Bible that Jesus taught wasn't what the experience that I was having in church. And I began to experience what was in the Bible, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, healings. There was even this one point in time where Natalie got very badly ill, her her, arms, her hands began to contract, her muscles began to constrict, and and she was falling before me in my very eyes. And because we were new in the town, I didn't know where the hospital was. And and in that moment, she prayed in tongues, and the Holy Spirit gave me instantly the interpretation in English. And in an instant, in that very moment, I watched the spirit of anorexia leave her flesh, and her health was completely restored. And one of the most prolific revelations after that that I received personally was on this passage in the book of Ephesians that the apostle Paul wrote to um, this church that was under his apostolic covering. And he wrote that Jesus gifted to the church five ministers to lead his body until his return. Many people call them the five-fold ministry, apostles, prophets, shepherds, teachers, evangelists. And I started preaching this stuff in a closet to our hot water heater before I heard anyone else preach this. I was preaching for practice because I didn't feel very confident in my ability to public speak or to, to write sermons on a weekly basis. But I knew that God had called me at this point to plant a church. A year after being in Seattle, God sent us to East Texas for a time of inner healing and equipping and preparation. And a year and a half after that, Natalie and I, alongside our neighbors, planted a church where we were the senior leaders in Jonesboro, Arkansas on May 15, 2016. For four years after planting that church, though, I followed the plans and the models of ministry as I was instructed to be seeker sensitive. And I tried the best that I could to be seeker sensitive and to draw a crowd. But when the pandemic hit in 2020, I was tired of doing church the way that man told me. I went back to my convictions and what the Spirit of God told me to preach. And God met our church in and with revival. We saw healings and salvations, deliverances, miracles, manifest glory. I'm talking about there was gold dust and glory clouds that came into our gatherings. And God was slaying people in the Spirit. And I had not learned about any of this. I'd only read about it in His Word. I'd not seen it before with my eyes in, in this 
area that I ministered in this region. And I've stepped fully into my ministry as an apostolic reformer and revivalist ever since. I've seen the deaf hear. I've seen the lame walk. I've seen the sick healed. I've seen the captive set free. And I've seen the oppressed receive deliverance. And it's all because God took a boy from 30 minutes down the road who knew his name but didn't understand his way and God fixed my faith. See, one thing about religious spirits, religious spirits don't like faith because faith disrupts the pre-planned order. If you want to know more about Jesus and what the Bible really teaches a sound doctrine, I encourage you, like and subscribe to follow me. And if you're looking for a home church, I'm going to put the link in our description, the description of this video, for our church's digital discipleship platform available to our online members. I look forward to connecting with you.